We have Pete Simi from University of Nebraska who's going to talk about violent hate groups, correct? Yes. Come on up. Um, appreciate the opportunity to um, speak with you today. Um, can, can you hear me okay? So uh, basically, um, what I want to argue today is that uh, violent extremism, terrorism, radicalization, all of these things are somewhat like a prism. And depending on what angle you look at it from, you see different things. Um, so I'm at the University of Nebraska, and I work in a research center that's interdisciplinary. And, and we have folks from psychology and computer science, um, and, and myself from criminology. And uh, one of the things that um, I think it's somewhat distinctive about our, our program of research is that we're looking across different types of violent actors to include um, far right, far left, jihadi, and then even um, uh, groups like conventional street gangs that often aren't included in discussions of radicalization and terrorism. Uh, as as a, a, a point of comparison, if, if for no other reasons, but to look at how, how violence may vary across different kinds of groups. And so, uh, Today, I, I want to uh, kind of focus on some broad themes uh, looking at uh, this idea of violent extremism a, as a prism. August 5th, 2012, Wade Michael Page walks into a Sikh temple in Oak Creek, Oak Creek Wisconsin, just outside of Milwaukee, a suburb of Milwaukee. Page is uh, armed with a 9 millimeter handgun lots of ammunition, earbuds in to keep from getting distracted, calmly approaches the temple, moves inside to where people are praying, and starts opening fire. Ultimately kills six individuals while he's in the temple. Uh, during his time there, uh, one of the, the victims uh, fights him off. He, the victim, uh, the individual that fights him off, ultimately is, is uh, shot and killed. But this, this person uh, uh, approaching Page and defending himself um, kind of distracts Page, and he leaves the temple at that point in time. Uh, when Page gets to the parking lot of the temple, first responders are on the scene. Uh, a law enforcement officer uh, and, and Page exchange fire. Uh, Page um, shoots and wounds the officer something like nine times. Officer goes down, miraculously survives. Other officers by this time are on the scene. At, at some point, Page is uh, wounded in the stomach and then decides to take his own life. He shoots himself in the head. So um, Page uh, did this in 2012. About 10 years prior to that, he was a subject who I spent a lot of time with as part of field work with active members of far-right extremist groups. And so I had learned quite a bit about his background. And so I want to share with you a few uh, things that I learned about him as a way to try and understand this act of violence. And when something like a shooting rampage like this happens, we're, we're confronted with how to, how to define it, how to understand it. Is it an act of terrorism? Is it a hate crime? Is it a more generic shooting rampage? Is it driven by personal grievances? a political ideology, a religious ideology, these are all the questions that end up circulating after an incident like this happens. One of the, some of the things we know about Page's background, we know that he entered the military in 1992, and uh, initially at Fort Bliss in Texas, and then at uh, Fort Bragg in North Carolina. Um, when he gets to Fort Bragg, he meets a current member of the white supremacist movement who's active duty at Fort Bragg. And it's around this time that Fort Bragg actually has a huge cluster of active white supremacists on the base there. Uh, Page meets one of them and starts to get indoctrinated. Uh, prior to that, uh, Page had never been involved in any kind of extremist groups. So it's really during his time in the military that he starts the radicalization process. He leaves the army uh, in 98 and immediately starts getting involved with various white supremacist groups, the National Alliance, eventually becomes a member of the Hammerskin Nation, which is uh, what he was part of when he committed the shooting rampage in 2012. Uh, so he spends, really, from 95 until the shooting rampage in 2012, getting increasingly immersed in this world of white supremacy, 
He's very active uh, in the music scene in particular. There's a whole underground neo-Nazi white power music scene uh, active not only in the United States but across the globe, actually even much larger in Europe than in the U.S. Uh, Page gets heavily involved in the music scene. He plays bass guitar, and so it's a way for him to do politics but also pursue his passion of music. Uh, eventually, though, he feels like the involvement in this type of uh, political activism, because they, they view the music as a form of political activism, isn't enough. And that more dramatic, more intense uh, uh, tactics are necessary. And this, this uh, is something that uh, seems to precede the decision to go on the shooting rampage. Now, the Sikh temple is not just any uh, target. You know, it's not just any accidental target, right? The target represents the hatred for anything that's considered what they call non-white. So the temple, uh, there is a very intentional kind of ideological component to his selection of this target. But there's also a lot of personal things happening in his life that have been unfolding for a number of years. He's a severe alcoholic, blackout drunk, uh, chronic depression, uh, problems uh, sustaining employment, problems sustaining romantic relationships. So there's a lot of kind of personal level grievances that are driving him as well. And I think um, Page and the Sikh Temple uh, shooting rampage are a good example of how a lot of these kinds of incidents may be actually hybrids. In other words, it's not necessarily that they're either ideologically or religiously inspired or they're personally inspired. They may be a combination of the two. I think we saw this in, in Fort Hood with Hassan, uh, Nidal Hassan, who, who shot uh, uh, a number of uh, um, active military uh, at, at the base there at Fort Hood. Initially, that was called workplace violence. Others uh, objected to that and called it an act of terrorism because he had been radicalized to a, a kind of violent jihadist extremist ideology. And, uh, you know, if, quite frankly, I think it's probably in that case as well some combination. And so, depending on how we look at these incidents, again, how we, uh, uh, what angle we're looking at the incidents, we see different things. We, we can see personal grievances, we can see uh, larger political and ideological motives. It doesn't have to be uh, one or the other. So I want to talk about a few different indicators that we can think about and use to try and, and look at these types of violent acts. Uh, one is the level of destructiveness. Uh, what ultimately, what's the ultimate consequence or outcome of the violent incident? One is the motivation. How, what, what seems to be driving the, the violence? And then associations. Is this a, an individual? Is it a, a person who's part of a group? Are they inspired by a larger cause? These are all different dimensions that we can look at to try and help give us some uh, further kind of understanding of how to look at a particular violent incident. So now I want to use two incidents that I'm sure you're probably familiar with, the Boston Marathon bombing more recently, and then Columbine, uh, the shooting rampage at Columbine High School in Colorado that became kind of um, probably one of the most well-known incidents of school violence um, over the last couple decades. Um, one of the things that's interesting is after Boston happened, um, uh, an analyst uh, was on CNN talking about um, the incident. And one of the things he immediately did is he made a comparison to Columbine. So it's, it's interesting. Uh, many people would look at Boston and see it purely as terrorism, but he said this does not look much like Al-Qaeda. This looks a lot more like Columbine. Um, so there, there are some interesting comparisons between Boston and, and um, Columbine. So you both involved a dyad in terms of the offenders. You had two individuals. In, in Boston, you had brothers. In Columbine, you had good friends, best friends, we might say, who were the perpetrators of the violence. Um, <clears throat> in both cases, it's probably likely that the violence would not have occurred if not for, in the case of Boston, the older brother, and in the case of Columbine, uh, Harris, Eric Harris. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that one of the individuals in Columbine, Harris, was the mastermind, and Dylan Klebold uh, was not nearly as involved in, in the planning of that incident. 
Um, so that there are certain things that these uh, share in common. Now, I think a lot of folks would say, yeah, but in Boston you have the older brother who's clearly traveled abroad and inspired by a, a larger international cause, who's inspired by this kind of violent jihadi ideology. It doesn't seem to be any ideology inspiring the Columbine shooters. But I think when you look back at Columbine, one of the things that's interesting is that they left a lot behind the shooters. Uh, diaries and journals and so forth, videos and so forth. And um, the incident, I think, has largely been understood as school violence, uh, kids getting maybe bullied to the point of committing violence. Uh, the, initially, there was a lot of talk about the trench coat mafia and a role that may have played in, in the incident. Uh, maybe there's some discussion about potential mental health problems, video games. Not a lot of talk about terrorism, though, when we think of Columbine. But if you actually look at Harris's journals, he planned Columbine and was inspired by Tim McVeigh in the Oklahoma City bombing. He was essentially trying to, his goal was to outdo the body count in Oklahoma City. He wanted to kill hundreds of people. They, they had bombs, explosives, that were supposed to detonate. So the, the Columbine shooting rampage wasn't supposed to be a shooting rampage. It was intended to be a major act of, uh, of bombing. Um, with multiple bombs that would go off, and as people were leaving the school, then they were going to essentially snipe, act as snipers and pick people off who were leaving the school. So that's how it was intended to be. How it ended up it was different. The bombs didn't work. There were problems, logistic problems with the explosives, and they had to go inside the school and start shooting people from within the school. But the goal really was, like I said, to, to uh, outdo uh, McVeigh, and, and, and Harris in particular really uh, idolized McVeigh. He was also inspired by Adolf Hitler as well, uh, and, and wrote a lot about his um, reverence, if you will, for, for Hitler. Um, there's pretty good evidence that, that Harris is, was probably, you know, uh, had some suffering from psychopathic um, personality disorder of some sort. Um, so again, now we're back to you know, personal drivers. So, again, it, you know, it's a combination, uh, not necessarily one or the other. And too often, I think, we want these incidents to fit neatly into a category. It's either a personal grievance, it's a workplace, it's terrorism, it's political, it's ideological, it's religious. And, and oftentimes, these things just don't fit neatly. Now, I want to then hold up this prism of, of violent extremism and, and say, okay, when we talk about violent extremism and terrorism and radicalization, what do we have in mind? I think it's safe to say, uh, especially, uh, certainly in the aftermath of 9-11 and then more recently with San Bernardino, people have very clear images, oftentimes, of what terrorism looks like and what it means. And it doesn't necessarily look like this. It doesn't necessarily look like domestic uh, extremist groups. Uh, instead, it looks like um, Islamic jihadi extremists. And, and so, in, in a way, terrorism has become synonymous with that. And so, I think if you look at the prism, though, and you shift it a little bit, you have to start asking yourself some different questions. And Newsweek does this for us. They make this claim that right-wing extremists are a bigger threat than ISIS in the United States. And some people might be sitting there, you know, scratching your head. How on earth could somebody say this? How is this possible? Uh, certainly there are a number of people who would push back on this and say this is a ridiculous claim. This is uh, just hyperbole. Well, if we look at just in terms of fatalities, and it's only one measure, um, but it's obviously a very important one. When we look at, nine, you know, since 9-11 on U.S. soil, the number of Americans, you know, killed by these two distinct threats. Um, it's close. Um, Prior to San Bernardino, it wasn't nearly as close. Um, but even, even after San Bernardino, more Americans have been killed by right-wing extremists on U.S. soil than jihadi extremists. So again, this again suggests, looking at this from a prism, you know, looking at this angle, this is not an angle we would necessarily, I think, um, oftentimes associate when we think of terrorism, radicalization, and um, violent extremism. So another, another angle to, to look at is the violence itself. 
And so we're currently working on a series of interviews with former members of extremist groups on the far left, far right, and, and jihadi uh, groups as well. And I, I wanted to, to just you know, provide this quote from, this is a, a former animal liberation extremist who talks about the perspective of violence from the extremists. And that's sometimes hard to do, to take the perspective of, of the extremists. We, we look at violent extremism from the outside looking in, and it's hard to see it from their vantage point. But it's an important vantage point to do. So again, it's that an, another angle on the prism that when we look at things from the extremist perspective, we might see some things that are helpful, useful, relevant in terms of providing you know, additional understanding and clarification. So he says, I, I always said I was doing these things, bombings and arsons, out of love, but I'm engaging in violence. Arson is a violent activity. Burning this wood, concrete, primate lab is going to save these animals, and that is the greater good. And that's the lesser evil. Yeah, I'm committing the lesser evil, but it's to prevent the greater evil. So th in that way, I don't see the actions we took, even the arsons, as violent. Now I can make a good case for why it wasn't violent, but I can also make a good case for why it was violent, you know. Context is a lot. There's a good place in history for people who have challenged unjust laws by breaking laws, doing things that at the time were seen as very illegal and violent, but now we look back and celebrate it. Yeah, I agree, arson is violent, but so is owning a car. You know, commercial agriculture and the amount of pesticides that are put on our food, that's violence too. So in a way, I agree that arsons are violent, but I also agree that most of what Americans do is also violent. So here you have an individual who's struggling internally, individually, with their own past in terms of whether what they did was violent or not. But they're also asking us, they're challenging us to think about the world we live in and, and are the things that we define as violent, is it always that clear cut between what's violent and what's nonviolent? And, and I think this person, is on the one hand, they're, they're illustrating some uh, aspects of moral disengagement, cognitive techniques to rationalize the use of violence. Tim McVeigh did it when he talked about collateral damage in Oklahoma City. Um, so there's some of that going on here too, but they're also, I think, raising some interesting points about what is violence and what is not violence. Is uh, the poisoning of drinking water in Flint, Michigan, is that an act of violence? I, I don't know. Uh, again, it's you know, further, further questions to be raised. And then the last angle on the prism that I want to raise is this issue about, is the threat of terrorism exaggerated? And again, for some people, the idea of asking that question is unfathomable. How could you possibly say the threat of terrorism is exaggerated? And I'm not saying that. Philip Mudd is saying that. And Philip Mudd is a CIA analyst, worked there, career at the CIA, and the FBI. They brought him over from the CIA to the FBI after 9-11 to do counterterrorism at the FBI. And he's largely credited with helping the FBI shift more in line with being intelligence gathering. And Philip Mudd says this, and it's a provocative quote. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I just want to throw it out there, and this will kind of be final thought. Look, I understand why Americans get concerned about terrorism. The Boston Marathon, it could happen in a military base in Texas. The randomness affects Americans. The fact that they can't explain the ideology. But if I have to balance this against other things that affect American life, I would step back and say, I'm someone who practiced this for decades. I don't worry about it very much. I've had people challenge me. Moms in suburban America, you know, you say you shouldn't worry much, but you're wrong. I worry. I worry a lot. There's this Muslim wave of terrorism that's coming at us, and it's changing our culture. My answer to them, to be blunt, is you have got to be kidding me. You're welcome to worry, that's your responsibility, but I'm an analyst and I deal with fact. And the fact is, if you judge threat by the impact on an American family, terrorism has a minuscule to near zero impact. Again, I'll let you be the judge of whether you think MUD's accurate, but it's a provocative statement and certainly I think challenges a lot of the conventional wisdom that exists today about the threat of terrorism. And so I'll just end it on that.